So uh, this is the idea of uh, the Buddha staying at Kapilavattu and staying with his family, yeah, which is kind of uh, always kind of interesting here. Um, so let's see what happens when he stays with his family. It's always complicated with family, right? Uh, you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, family are the people who are closest to us, but they're also the people we can disagree the strongest with. It's really, really complicated. Uh, and you will be su not surprised at all, it was exactly the same for the Buddha. Isn't that kind of nice? Uh, yeah, because if it is the same for the Buddha, it means that we're all kind of in the same boat. Uh, we all have similar kind of problems, sim similar kind of difficulties to deal with. Uh. So let's see what happened with the Buddha. And some of you will probably know already because you have pre-read the, the suttas. <laughs> Good on you for pre-reading the suttas. Then the Buddha robed up in the morning, taking his bowl and robe, he entered Kapilavattu for arms. He wandered for arms in Kapilavattu. So I will stop there because... Um, I don't know about you, but I find this already quite interesting here. Yeah. yeah, and uh, the things that you will notice here about the Buddha, he sounds very much like an ordinary monk. Yeah, yeah you robe up in the morning, put on your I don't think he did this kind of twisting that we do, but he put on his robe in a, in a different way like they did in ancient India. Puts on his robe, yeah? Take your bowl and your other robe, you carry your other robe with you. Yeah, yeah? Buddha does this. He looks after himself. In another sutta, he talks about the Buddha putting his lodging in order or his dwelling in order. Uh, yeah, this is found in the, uh, in the uh, Upakalesa Sutta, Majjhimanika 128, uh, the Sutta on Defilements. Uh, yeah, the Buddha does what everyone else does. Uh, then he goes in for arms in Kapilavattu. Uh, how would you feel if the Buddha came for arms uh, one day? You were going to put some food in his bowl. Would you, oh, the Buddha's coming. <laughs> We're kind of interesting, right? If the Buddha was going to give you arms. So you, you can imagine that what is happening here is that in those days, the Buddha was pretty much an ordinary monk. Yeah. And when he came into this into the town, people probably wouldn't be all that shaky. The reason we get shaky is because we have a different idea of the Buddha compared to what they had. For them, it was quite natural. The Buddha coming for arms. Oh, yeah, how are you, Venerable Sir? You'd probably be, be polite to him, right? At least some people were polite to the Buddha, not everyone, of course. So this is kind of one of those very fascinating things. And I think one of the things that we have to learn as Buddhists, and I will talk more about this in the second part of this course, but relating to the Buddha in the right kind of way, understanding who he really is. And when you see him in this way, wandering for arms in Kapilavattu, you recognize he was a person, he was a human being, who he was in many ways quite extraordinary because he was an arahant, of course, but we all have the potential for being arahants. So fundamentally, we are the same as the Buddha. There isn't any absolute difference between us and the Buddha. And that is a very kind of, a very, very useful reflection because it brings us closer to the Buddha. It makes us being able to relate to the Buddha, yeah? Okay, if the Buddha comes for arms, actually no need to get too nervous about the Buddha coming for arms, yeah? It's okay. The Buddha's not going to bite you or anything like that, uh, yeah? The Buddha's going to be kinder. The Buddha's always kind people. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, I, I told this before, I, was, uh, I visited uh, Ajahn Ganha, Lumpur Ganha in Thailand a few years ago. And Ajahn Ganha is this monk who has this very kind of great, grand reputation uh, in Thailand uh, and he's the kind of monk, he's a very, very sweet monk. This is why I kind of like to do sweet things as well, because it kind of it sweetens things up. It makes things a bit lighter, yeah? And he's very sweet, and he says things like, okay, okay, and that kind of, kind of sweet things. So. <laughs> and uh, so I was sitting there with him, and because I, you know, I've been a monk for a long time, now almost 30 years as a monk, that's quite, a, I don't know, some people say it's long, I'm not sure, it's kind of, to me it's kind of neutral, but whatever. And so he puts me kind of next to him. So he sits on this grand chair, kind of the throne, yeah? And I get a smaller throne next to him. <laughs> it's kind of funny to be a monk. You kind of never really expect these things when you're ordained. But anyway, that's what happens. You sit next to him. And uh, then I was sitting next to Adangana and I had this really strange experience when I was sitting next to him. And I was sitting there and I was watching him. Yeah, I'm not supposed to, if, sure if you're supposed to look at him. Because I was kind of looking at him and... And then as I looked at him, I, I thought, I thought, uh, actually, Ajangana, you're getting a bit old and ugly here. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I thought, well, maybe this is not the right kind of thought. Maybe this is thankful. Huh? But then my second thought was, but even though you're getting a bit old and ugly, huh, you're still beautiful because all the spiritual qualities are shining through. Huh? So you still have this beautiful kind of aura about you, regardless of your external appearance. Actually, it wasn't that ugly. That's kind of, kind of one of those thoughts that can come up sometimes there. Uh, so I had this thought, and it kind of you could argue maybe a bit disrespectful, but it was also a little bit true, right? So it's okay. <laughs> and then as I as I had this thought, and I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but then I just after I had thought that, uh, he turns to the other side, kind of away from me, and he looks at this woman on the other side. Uh, and this woman is also very old, yeah, and maybe not in the best best of states, yeah, getting very very old sometimes. Uh. And he looks at this woman and he says to this woman, he says that even though you know. Even though people get old and ugly, yeah, they can still be beautiful because of the spiritual qualities. Yeah. And I thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of scared. That's kind of amazing. Kind of shocks you a little bit when that happens. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. It was very specific, right? I mean, usually when people think that someone is reading your mind, it's kind of way too general. It doesn't mean anything at all. This was really, really specific. I don't know if it was accident or not, but it felt didn't feel like an accident. And uh, so, but, but the strange thing is that even though you are in the presence of someone like that, uh, even though maybe they are reading your mind, yeah, you never really feel scared. Uh, you never feel worried. And the reason is because of all the kindness that comes out of that person. Uh, why would you ever feel scared? And I knew that even if I wanted to murder Ajahn Ganha, right, uh, he still would be kind to me. And that's kind of the extraordinary thing. Uh, it's like the uh, fem simile of the soul. If bandits cut you apart, you know, limb by limb, you still have metta towards them. That's exactly the feeling I had with Ajahn Ganha. Even if I cut him up so limb by limb, he would still have metta towards me. Uh, and so I think it's the same with the Buddha, right? Even though the Buddha is like this great master with all these qualities, uh, even though he can probably read your mind, and not, he wouldn't probably wouldn't be interested, right? But he would, <laughs> he probably could if he if he wanted to. Uh, still, the idea is that the qualities of the Buddha are so powerful that you will always actually feel relaxed around the Buddha. Yeah, you feel at ease, uh, unless you are a real dodgy character. But if you were a dodgy character, you wouldn't be here. So you should be, uh, you you would be all right. Uh, so this is the kind of the um, meeting the Buddha, right? When you see the Buddha in this way, uh, he comes across as an ordinary person. Uh, when you see Ajahn Ganha, it's impossible to be afraid. Uh, he comes across as this ordinary old monk, yeah, who is about to fall apart at any minute because he's really kind of doddery, can barely walk, you know, these kind of things. Uh, and still, there is this kind of beautiful feeling about it. Uh, so this is kind of what the Buddha is about. Uh, and so understanding the Buddha in the right way really matters. Then we can make a connection there. Uh, and of course, I asked Ajahn Ganna all kinds of questions. I didn't really feel very shy at all, at all around Ajahn Ganna because he was very friendly. And I think he expects Western monks to be a bit wacky anyway, so we kind of we, we get, get, get away with sort of asking all kinds of crazy things. So, uh, that was what, um, so that was really that. And so this is one of the things I want to uh, kind of discuss during this course, is the idea how to relate to the Buddha in the right way. And you can see here little things like this, they actually bring out some of the qualities of the Buddha. So you have to read a little bit between the lines and actually take on board all of these little things. And it gives you a feeling for who the Buddha was as a person. And then the Buddha can really become your teacher. And then when the Buddha becomes your teacher, you start reading the suttas in an entirely new way. It becomes much more powerful. So let's see what happens. After the meal, on his return from arms around, he went to the great wood, plunged deep into it, and sat at the root of a young wood apple tree for the day's meditation. So this is the uh, typical thing that uh, the monks would do in those days. Yeah, They would have their meal, and then they would uh, go on uh, arms around, after their arms around, and then they would do go for the day's abiding. The day's abiding is the diva vihara. It literally means the day's uh, yeah, abiding, but it always implies meditation. Uh, and one of the great meditations of the Buddha is the Mahakaruna meditation, the great uh, compassion meditation. Uh, this was a standard thing that they would do. And uh, great wood is the Mahavana, is uh, what that is. Uh, famous wood near uh, Kapilavatu. Uh, 
Then Dandapani, the Sakyan, while going for a walk, also plunged. I don't know why he uses the word plunge, but anyway, that's what he does. Plunged deep into the great wood. He approached the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, he stood to one side, leaning on his staff, and said to the Buddha, so Dandapani literally means staff in hand. Danda is staff or stick, Pani is hand. So it means the second with a staff in his hand. I think probably it is more like an epithet or a nickname rather than his real name. But I don't think his mother would have called him staff in hand. <laughs> it's an unusual name. Unusual name. I mean, maybe she was a very unusual mother, but still. <laughs> um, and then he goes up to the Buddha, yeah? And then he always, as always, we have the conversation, the uh, polite conversation. Uh, and then he stands on one side, leaning on his staff. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of an uh, interesting little point. This is in the sutta, not without reason. Yeah, all of these things have a certain meaning. Uh, so when someone is leaning on his staff, uh, that is inappropriate. Uh, yeah, it is kind of... A conduct which is considered slightly arrogant and proud. And uh, there is a, a, a Sekya rule, one of the rules of a monastics, is that you should not teach someone who has a staff in their hand. You know, if someone has a staff in the hand, they're considered a bit kind of arrogant and uppity, and they think that they are really whatever, uh, whatever it is. Yeah? So obviously here is someone who has a problem with being proud, arrogant, etc., etc. That is kind of the background here that you need to understand uh, yeah, so this matters. So who is this Dandapani the Sakyan? Yeah, where does it, what is the relation? Why is he arrogant, perhaps? And we shall see in a second the way he speaks to the Buddha is also not very nice. Actually, let's have a look at that first, what he says. Then I can discuss a bit about who he might be as a person. This is what he says. What is the ascetic's doctrine? What does he assert? What do you reckon? Does that sound like a polite way of, of speaking to the Buddha? It doesn't sound very polite, right? It sounds a bit sort of uh, very kind of direct and a little bit disrespectful. Yeah? What does the ascetic, there's no kind of venerable sir or anything like that. It says, what is the ascetic's doctrine? It sounds a bit uh, kind of blunt and direct and not, not, quite, not quite right. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, seems to be the problem with this Dandapani, is that he was maybe had some kind of ill will against the Buddha or something like that. And uh, according to certain traditions, uh, it seems that he may have been the father of the Buddha's previous wife, yeah? sometimes it's called Yashodara, and uh, he may have been her father. And maybe he then was a bit upset that he kind of left her alone or something like that. Yeah, now he comes back and he kind of has a grudge and he kind of goes off and he kind of not really happy with the Buddha. And he kind of tell, asks him this kind of question, which uh, coming more from the idea of a grudge than from a real uh, inquiring mind. And uh, that kind of then puts things a little bit into perspective. Uh, there were some other uh, ideas as well that it may have been... Uh, uh, someone else in the Buddha's family, but obviously has some kind of connection to the Buddha, which may have been negative, and thus is his negative uh, uh, way of talking. Yeah. Let me, the information, the place I have this from is actually from Bhante Sujato. He's the one who did this particular research. Uh, let me see, uh, see what he has to say about this again. Uh, Madhu Pindaka Sutta. Oh, it's too large. Mm. <clears throat> so these are little footnotes that he has added to the suttas, which can be quite, uh, quite nice. Um, Mm. 
Okay, so here we go. So Dandapane was said to be the brother of the Buddha's birth mother, Maya, and foster mother. Okay, so there you are. So either he was the uh, the father of Yashodara, or he was a brother of the Buddha's uh, birth mother, Maya. Maya is the, she is the one who died after seven days, and uh, also the foster mother, Mahapajapati. So either case, he may have had a bit of a grudge against the Buddha for uh, for not kind of um, yeah for killing his sister or whatever it is that he might have might have may have taken it. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, let's go back to the. So that is uh, what he asks. So, of course, the Buddha, when he is uh, uh, confronted in this way with someone who is maybe coming not from pure motives, then the Buddha will also kind of give an answer that may be not as straightforward as you might think. Yeah? So maybe the Buddha will kind of uh, say something which makes him reflect upon himself a little bit yeah? because he knows he's coming from the wrong place. Uh, so this is what the Buddha replies. Uh, Sir, first of all, he said, sir, right? Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. My doctrine is such that one does not conflict with anyone in this world, with its gods, Maras, Brahmas, this population, with, with its ascetics and Brahmins, its gods and humans. Yeah, so this is kind of where he puts Dandapane a little bit into his place by saying that, uh, well, in, according to my doctrine, you don't conflict with anyone in the world, yeah? You kind of just uh, deal with issues as they are, but you don't actually create any uh, additional conflicts with anyone. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, here includes everybody in the sense of ascetics and Brahmins. Uh, this will be the people who have all kinds of teachings and doctrines, uh, and so you don't actually argue with such people either, just because they have a different doctrine or teaching from yours. Uh, so anyone in the world, even Mara, you don't even come into conflict with Mara. So what is the best way of doing that? Is that to say, yes, when Mara says, okay, to have that extra ice cream. Do you then say yes, not to comfort in Mara, or do you say no to Mara? Okay, I'll leave that to you to decide. You can <laughs> figure that one out. <laughs> that depends. So... Um, this, is what, this is the first thing it says. And then the second thing it says is as follows. And it is such, in other words, the doctrine is such that perceptions do not underlie the Brahmin who lives detached from sensual pleasures. Without doubting, stripped of worry, rid of craving from rebirth in this or that state. So this is what he tells this Dandapani. And of course, I don't know if you were in Dandapani's place, what would you say to the Buddha if he said that? What would you say? Would you say, yes, makes sense? Or would you say, actually, don't know what you mean? Or what, what, would, you, what would you reply? Can you imagine Dandapani? Dandapani doesn't know anything about the Buddha's teachings. And the first thing he hears is this. You might think, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of, it's fascinating because it is obviously quite profound. And the Buddha probably said this to, the, to this Brahmin or to Dandapani specifically to make him a bit, maybe a bit confused, yeah? to make him think a bit deeper yeah? so he wouldn't carry on arguing. Yeah? If you get something that is so profound you don't understand it, well, what are you going to say? You can't really carry on arguing or anything like that. Yeah? So let's try to figure out what's going on here. Yeah? Yeah? So it starts off by saying... It is such that perceptions do not underlie the Brahmin who lives detached from sensual pleasures. What does this mean? Well, detached from sensual pleasures or from this five sense world means that you no longer have any cravings or attachment in the sensory world. Yeah, that's really what that means, detached from sensual pleasures. You understand the drawbacks of that sens sensory world. You understand that there's nothing there to really hold on to or to be, be attached to. Yeah? So this already talks about someone who is very highly attained on the Buddhist path. And that's why he's called a Brahmin. A Brahmin here is a metaphor for someone who has gone to the very end of the path, usually an Arahant. Yeah? So the Arahant who lives detached from sensual pleasures. Perceptions do not underlie this Brahmin. What does that mean? Perceptions do not underlie her. The word for underlie here is the idea of anusaya. 
In Anusayas, there are kind of what is often called the underlying tendencies. Yeah? And so the deepest sense of defilements in the human mind are the underlying tendencies. These are the things that kind of sit there waiting for an opportune moment to spring out. Yeah, you may be very happy, you may be going along, yeah, I don't feel angry anymore, there's no anger, yay! And suddenly, it is still there, underlying you, the wrong person comes, and bang, you feel upset again. You know what I mean? Yeah, if, if, anyone, if someone here doesn't know what I mean, then congratulations. <laughs> it means you're doing really, really well on the path. But this is kind of the underlying tendency, this waiting inside of you for the right kind of moment, and then it comes up. And so what the Buddha is saying here is that if you are an Arahant, if you are this kind of Brahmin, then you don't have the sort of perceptions yeah, that underlie you, that allow these things to come out anymore. Yeah? So th those wrong kind of perceptions, the faulty way of looking at the world, they have been so completely demolished that the underlying tendencies have also been demolished. And that's why you're an Arahant. So this does not refer to all perceptions. It only refers to the wrong kind of perceptions on the Buddhist path. The ones that lead to defilements, the one that leads to problems, the one that leads to rebirth, the one that leads to dukkha. This is what actually this refers to. So there's a kind of slightly strange way of saying things. Yeah? And so, but here you need to interpret things a little bit. Yeah? And uh, then... Based on that, the Buddha says, without doubting, yeah, stripped of worry, rid of craving in this or that state. So these are just what happens when you become enlightened. You don't have any doubt anymore. Vichikicca is abandoned, one of the fetters for, for enlightened, uh, enlightenment. Uh, stripped of worry. Uh, the, uh, uh, someone who is full enlightened doesn't have any worry or any kind of anxiety anymore. This is just the nature of being enlightened again, because worry and anxiety arises because we cannot control the world. And so this poor person doesn't want to control the world, and so they are stripped of worry. Let me just check the Pali here, because suddenly I become doubtful as to the Pali. If I check the Pali too much, let me know, and I shall stop checking the Pali so much. Actually, this doesn't have the Pali. Ah, okay. So uh, let's see here. Stripped of worry. Chinna uh, kukuchang. Okay, so kukucha is the Pali word. Kukucha usually means worry. If you, uh, if you do something bad and you are worried about maybe you have worried that you have done something wrong and you're concerned about that, that's usually what it means, kukucha. Uh, uh, you know the, the fourth hindrance on the Noble Eightfold Path, on the, sorry, no, the fourth of the five hindrances is Uddha Kukucha, restlessness and worry. And this is what this means, and it refers to the, your conduct usually. So you are, you are solid, you don't have any problems with your conduct, uh, and you are rid of craving and rebirth and that or that, uh, this or that existence, uh, yeah? which obviously is the end of the Buddhist path uh, when you don't want to be reborn anywhere anymore now. So this is uh, what the Buddha says to Dandapani. So what does Dandapani respond? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, he <laughs> responds like this, maybe. Maybe, that, that's pretty much how he responds. That is my doctrine, that is what I assert. When he had spoken, Dandapani shook his head, waggled his tongue, raised his eyebrows until his brow puckered in three furrows, and he departed, leaning on his staff. So Dandapani was perplexed, and he obviously didn't know what to say. And uh, uh, maybe that was part of the purpose of the Buddha, not to get into a long argument. So someone becomes perplexed, and they kind of walk off. So uh, that's what happened to Dandapani. Did he become an Arahant eventually? We don't know. There is no more references to Dandapani anywhere. Don't know what happened to, to him. But uh, sometimes what happens when you meet someone like the Buddha is that maybe even if you are upset initially, later on when you come to think about it, then you realize, actually, maybe I made a mistake. And then you come back to the teachings later on. I think this can often happen. 
So uh, this may have been the case here as well. Huh? So that is uh, the meeting with Dandapani. But uh, still, yeah, maybe, I don't know if you are satisfied with the meaning of this. Uh, maybe not quite. Let's see what happens next. Uh, Then, in the late afternoon, the Buddha came out of retreat and went to the Banyan Tree Monastery, sat down on the seat spread out, and told the mendicants what had happened. Yeah, so this is a kind of a standard thing that happens in the, uh, the suttas. Uh, in the afternoon, you uh, finish your meditation, uh, you come out, and then you have a Dhamma discussion yeah, after a kind of a day of retreat. And uh, so the Buddha comes to the mendicants and it tells them what has happened. Uh, and this is kind of interesting. Usually the Buddha doesn't tell people what has happened, right? Uh, so uh, here, obviously, he must have felt that there was some significance to that occasion. Uh, and he gave a teaching that perplexed Dandapani. And maybe he wanted the monks to reflect on this teaching. Yeah, what does it actually mean? Uh, and so he gives it to them. Uh, and he gives them an opportunity to re reflect on what actually is going on there. Uh. So this is, uh, again, this idea of how the interaction of the Buddha with the Sangha is kind of interesting. You see many different levels here of that kind of interaction. Uh, so it tells them what happened. And then uh, what happens next? As follows. So when he had spoken, one of the mendicants, one of the monks said to him, but sir, Asserting what doctrine does the Buddha not conflict with anyone in this world? With his gods, Maras and Brahmas, this population, with his ascetics and Brahmins, his gods and humans. And how is it that perceptions do not underlie the Buddha, the Brahmin who lives detached from sensual pleasures, without indecision, stripped of worry and rid of craving for rebirth in this or that state? So the monks too, yeah, maybe the nuns too, they were, didn't know what was going on or they were unsure. And so they asked the Buddha to elucidate the meaning of this statement. And this is what the Buddha replies. Mendicants, judgments driven by proliferating perceptions beset a person. If they don't find anything worth approving, welcoming, or getting attached to in the source from which these arise, just this is the end of the underlying tendencies to desire, to repulsion, to views, to doubt, to conceit, to the desire to be reborn, and to ignorance. This is the end of taking up of the rod and the sword, the end of quarrels, arguments, and disputes, of accusations, devices, speech, and lies. This is where these bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. This is what the Buddha said. When he had spoken, the Holy One, the Sugata, got up from his seat and entered his dwelling. So uh, this is uh, what the Buddha says. And this is uh, as an explanation of the previous statement. Uh, it is perhaps even more enigmatic and difficult to understand that the, than the original statement. <coughs> so uh, for that reason, it is kind of uh, interesting, uh, and it is something that we're going to have to uh, discuss in quite a bit of detail to understand what is going on here, because this is really the key to understanding perceptions. Yeah, You see here the idea of proliferating perceptions. Uh, this is uh, papancha sanya. Papancha is this word that actually refers to proliferating here. And so here we come to understand the nature of perceptions, uh, whether they are in accordance with the Dhamma or not. Uh, and you can take it that proliferating perceptions are what we want to get rid of. Uh, yeah, this is a problem uh, because prolif prolifer the idea of proliferating means like going out, expanding, yeah, moving on forever and ever. And so this is certainly a problem on the path. Uh, but uh, let's leave that for now. We'll come back to this uh, later on uh, after the meal. It's going to take a little bit of time to uh, give justice uh, to this particular expression. Uh, so uh, let's um, leave it there, and then we can discuss this, uh, uh, come to this later on. Uh. Um,
So let's just uh, chillax with a little bit more of uh, meditation and then we'll do some last Q&A before, before lunch. <clears throat> okay, so uh, any um, last questions? I think we had the gentleman over there uh, wanted to ask a question before. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Ajahn. Good morning. I'd like to know about perception. What influence of perception? What causes? Because I read somewhere say it may be due to memory, due to your karma that yeah. affects your perception. Uh, indeed. So, yeah. So, I'm going to come to this uh, in a second, actually, because this is what the, this really is about. You know, the judgments driven by proliferating perception. This is actually very much. Uh, we're going to come to this, you know, what actually drives this? Why do we have these proliferating perceptions? Uh, but yes, you could say that karma is one thing, you know, because karma will often decide whether you have a good life or a bad life. That is obviously related to perception. Uh, or habits is another very important thing, right? We have certain habits. Uh, you know, you, you know, they, they talk about people choosing the same profession, for example. You're a fireman. You're a fireman in your past life. You're a fireman in this life. Why? It's not because of karma, it's just because of your habits, really. You carry on your habits. So, so ultimately, it's about conditioning. Conditioning is the best way of thinking about it. Uh, so we are conditioned in a certain way, and that conditioning makes up our personality. And our personality, a very large part of that, is how we perceive the world. Yeah? That is kind of what, who we are as human beings. Uh, so basically, it's a conditioning of the past, all coming together in the present, uh, and then it issues in the present into a certain way of seeing the world and a certain way of dealing with the world there. So conditioning is the, ultimately the, the right way of thinking about it. And that includes combined, includes habits, and includes uh, memories, as you say, but memories is really also just uh, a conditioning from the past in a sense. So. Thank you. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, Ajahn, uh, since that uh, Danda, uh, this... Dandapani, Dandapani, Dandapani. Dandapani uh, he was actually leaning on stuff, and it, it's against the uh, Sekia rules. Then, yeah. why why did the Buddha actually proceed to <laughs> okay. uh, teach? So, yeah. isn't that against his own rules? Um, well, uh, that's okay. Good, good question. So, I would say that uh, there's a few ways to answer that question. Uh, one way of answering the question is that the rules apply to everyone, but not the Buddha. <laughs> but uh, that is a bit dodgy, right? Because usually the Buddha would follow his own rules. I, I think that is, I know some monks make that kind of claim, but I'm not really sure if that is uh, right. Uh, second possibility is that this was before that rule was laid down. That rule can be, could have been laid down later on. Yeah, we don't know about the sequence here. Uh, a third possibility is that that particular rule is a rule that is only broken if you do it out of disrespect. Uh, yeah. So if you say, I don't care about that rule, stupid rule, I'm going to teach anyway. If you do that way, then of course it's bad. Eh? But if you don't do it out of disrespect, you think, well, this is actually the appropriate occasion to give an answer because of whatever the circumstance might be, eh? then actually it is okay. You don't act, not actually breaking the rule. Eh? So the seikyas are a special class of rules that you can break given the, given the circumstances. Eh? So for example, there is a rule against uh, a standing while the audience is sitting down. Yeah, that's another rule in the seikya rules. Eh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you open a big one. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, can't. Yeah, okay. So anyway, there is a rule uh, against that. Uh, and but in the modern day, if you go to an auditorium, the lecture will often stand while the students sit down. But there's nothing disrespectful about that. Yeah. So because nothing disrespectful in that situation, uh, actually the rule probably doesn't apply in the modern situation. Uh, and this is how you deal with these minor rules. You look at them as a, in that, that kind of context, and you ask them if they are applicable or not. Uh, and if you don't keep it uh, because not because out of disrespect, then actually it's all right. Uh, yeah. 